So the aim then of this lecture will be to talk about uh, linear methods for supervised learning. And the idea of supervised learning is that we will have two kinds of data, input data and output data. Um, and the output data is the, the supervision signal. So for example, you might have um, a collection of images and that collection of images is the input. And then the labels is just someone telling you uh, whether the image is a face or not. So that's what you would use, for example, to build a face detect. Okay, so that the labels are just uh, essentially what a teacher would uh, use to say what the data is, what each data point is. <coughs> um, the machine learning for li uh, linear prediction is essentially something that's also known as linear regression. And most of you have seen least squares before and essentially that's what we're going to revise today, least squares. Um, and most of you know least squares, but this will allow, us, allow me to introduce um, the language. Now the inputs are also called, in statistics, more dryly, they go with the name covariates. Um, then the outputs are called various, because they vary as a function of the inputs. Um, the inputs are also known sometimes as features or the predictors. Um, and, and as I said just a while ago, the, the outputs are also known as the labels. Um, once we, uh, and, and so we're going to go over least squares and we're going to derive least squares. And we're going to derive least squares using the optimization approach. And in that process, I will also introduce the notation that I will use throughout this course, um, essentially matrices and vectors, which is what we use to code. Okay. So linear models by themselves are still quite useful because a lot of real processes can be approximated with linear models. Um, and if not one linear model, several linear models. For example, your, the controllers that ensure that your aircraft can land safely when you're flying, there's just a combination of linear models. And they work reliably well. Your planes don't crash often. Um, oops. <coughs> Uh, we, linear models, also when we introduce more complex models, you'll see that there's still going to be subcomponents that will be linear models. So it's, we need to know this in order to move on um, to more complex things. As I said, everything here can be done by hand. Uh, by, uh, by analytically, I mean that in a piece of paper, you can write a solution. When we do neural networks and, and, and other techniques, you'll find out that that's no longer possible. Um, we can't rely on doing anything by hand, but we have to use, we have to do computing. Um, okay, so let's, um, let's set up uh, the notation. Um, so I'm going to assume that I have n inputs and n outputs. So n here, this n here will indicate the number of instances <coughs> And when I write x1 to n, by that I mean the set of x1, x2, all the way up to xn. That is essentially MATLAB or Python notation. And I'm going to assume that input has d components. In other words, that there's d possible components. For example, x could be the height and weight of a person. So I would have x1 being his height and his weight. x2 is his height and his weight, and so on. And n would be the number of students in this classroom. In that case, d would be 2, because it's just the height and the weight. And then associated with it, there's going to be a label, y, which typically will be an element of the real line. By r, I mean the real line. And that might be, um, I don't know, a number, a continuous number, which is, I don't know, reflective of IQ. I might be trying to predict um, IQ from height and weight. It's kind of bogus to do that, but um, it, nonetheless, you can do it. And people often do these kind of bogus predictions. Okay, 
So here is an example that is not bogus, that is actually quite a relevant, concept, relevant example. So in this case, what we're going to do is I'm going to measure, I'm going to have two inputs, uh, the wind outside this building and the number of people inside this classroom. Those are my two inputs. Um, to get the wind outside, I can just get it from a website because it's being measured somewhere um, out there. And to get the number, which is the number of people in this room right now, all I need to do is put a counter on that door so that every time someone goes through, um, you get counted. Um, that's also standard technology, or most stores on Robson Street have counters at the doors, either through a mat or through a camera. So every time you walk into a store, you walk into a Ritzia, you're being counted and being monitored. Now, um, the, so those would be the two inputs. And so, uh, for example, in here I would have that this is one, two, three, four. So n is equal to four. Um, in this case, d is equal to two because there's two inputs. <coughs> so, for example, the vector x one which is in 2D will be 102. So it's a 2D vector um, that has two components and it has the two inputs. The corresponding label in this case will be a scalar, which is a matrix with one element, and that's the energy requirement to keep this room at a reasonable temperature. Okay. Um, why this would be useful is because classes have different number of students and in order to adjust the thermostat in this room, it would really help to know how many bodies are producing heat here and it also would be useful to know how cold it is outside. Okay, if, the, if there's a strong chill wind, I might have to increase the temperature. Um, if, uh, but, but if there are too many students in here, then I don't need to and so on. Now, if I knew that, if I knew how to have a system like this, um, if I could collect a lot of data throughout the term of how many students were in the classroom and, um, and what temperature we had to set that, the thermostat, in order to be comfortable. So imagine that the setup is as follows. Every day, someone comes in here, checks out how many people there are in the classroom, takes the, uh, looks at the website to see what the wind speed is outside, and then goes to there and uh, to the thermostat and adjusts adjusts the thermostat so that um, so that we have a comfortable temperature in, inside 20 degrees or so. Now this person does it for a whole year. We collect a lot of data. If the person did it four times, we would have collected the data set that I'm showing you here. Okay, that's after four data collections. Now, once we know this, so now what we can do is have a system that will automatically uh, just look at the wind speed and how many people are in this room and will automatically adjust the energy requirement. In other words, it will automatically adjust the thermostat because the thermostat detects the, the essentially um, governs how much energy is needed to keep the room at the comfortable speed. Uh, sorry, the com comfortable temperature. Um, so that's the game. Uh, we have four data points that an expert gave us. Um, we have two inputs, we have one output. And if we now can build a model that given two inputs can predict the output, we now have a very intelligent thermostat. And an intelligent thermostat would make sure that we always have a comfortable temperature. Moreover, most of the time the temperature here is being wasted because this room is too hot. So we're actually uh, burning coal or gas or whatever it is that we're burning in order to make this room overheated, um, costing Canada a lot of money, costing us a lot of money, um, costing our environment precious resources. So if we could fix that, if we could just make every room 10% more efficient, um, would be making a huge economic contribution toward Canada. Now, there are companies that actually arose over the last couple of years that do precisely this. They design intelligent thermostats and that's essentially what they do. They, they predict the energy demand 
and based on the predictions of energy demand, they automatically um, uh, buy energy from the energy providers. And then we ensure that the load is sort of even um, throughout the year. Um, so this is a very, um, energy prediction right now is a very hot topic. UBC definitely is very interested. UBC has been instrumented all buildings um, to, to make this uh, actually an actual rea reality. This year's Ichikai, um, which is the main conference on artificial intelligence, is dedicated to this topic. The, the topic of uh, energy prediction and computational sustainability. That is, using computer science um, in, in order to improve our management of natural resources. Okay, so once so the setup then is as follows. Um, in supervised learning, we always identify two two stages. One is the training of the model, and the second stage is the prediction. So the training, as I mentioned in step one, which I'm going to call the training phase, uh, we take the set of data x1 to n with the corresponding labels y1 to n, and I use curly brackets to indicate sets, um, the standard notation. And the sort of the, the flow is we take the data, we learn from the data, and what we really learn is a set of parameters. Parameters theta of a linear model. Very briefly, a linear model in, in, one, in 2D is just a line. It's this, the, the parameters would be the slope and the intercept of the line. And in 2D, it would be a plane. As we go to high dimensions, it would just be a high dimensional plane. Okay, that's training. Training is about getting some parameters. Now, the parameters are a summary of the data. Once you know theta, like you might have many points, but once you know the slope and the intercept, then you have all the information that the data conveys, and then you can throw away the data. The second phase is prediction. In prediction, we take a new point that we hadn't seen before, and we take our estimate of uh, theta that we got from phase one, the training phase. And then we put those two guys into a prediction machine, predict. And what comes out is yn plus one. And I'm going to put a hat on top of it to indicate that it's a prediction. So the hat <coughs> indicates prediction. Okay. So we take the training data, which is n data samples, and we use that to infer theta. Once we have theta, we use that theta to make predictions for new axes. So given new wind speeds, a number of students here, I would predict how to adjust this thermostat automatically. <coughs> and the person that had to come here and adjust the <coughs> thermostat by hand, and actually at UBC there's a bunch of people doing that. Um, the beauty of this is that those people will be put out of a job because everything will be done automatically more efficiently. Now, that's one of the biggest things that you need to be thinking about in machine learning. I said it as a joke, but it's actually machine learning is creating a lot of automation, and automation is replacing many people's jobs. So with machine learning, there's very interesting uh, societal issues. Um, here's another example. Um, in this example, in uh, medical research, um, there are several inputs. And the inputs in this case um, for prostate cancer, uh, in a prostate cancer study, are things like the log cancer volume, um, the prostate weight of a male, uh, the age of the male, um, et cetera, et cetera. So a bunch of variables, um, medical terms that you know, describe the, the condition of a patient 
And then uh, what we're trying to predict in this case, in this study, um, the, um, which appears in the book of Hasti Chipshirani, uh, which is freely available on um, the course website. Um, they were trying to predict an antigen because they're trying to de design appropriate treatments to help patients. Um, so if in, in the world of medicine, machine learning has become extremely important. Um, you know, the B we work closely with the BC Cancer Agency because um, we can actually sort of impact healthcare. Okay, so let's look now at an example in 2D. Okay. In 2D, um, a linear model is essentially a line. It has a slope, which in this case is theta 2. There is only one input, which is x, and there's only one output, which is y. And then uh, the intercept of the line is theta 1. And then how do we find out the best theta 1 and theta 2 given a set of data? We minimize an objective function. Okay. So j, this j here, I'm going to call an objective function. I'm going to call it a cost function. I'm going to call it also a loss function or the energy. And then the energy will become more clear when what the meaning is when we do, um, um, when we do neural networks. And it's also called the error. So the optimization approach to machine learning is about formulating a cost function. Once you formulate a cost function, then you just need to find its minimum and that's the solution. Okay? And the cost function depends on the date. Okay? So in particular, oh, and for short, I'm going to write this, I'm using this notation there. So instead of writing y of xi, I'm just calling it yi. Okay. And so what's the picture that goes with this? Um, the picture is as follows. We have two variables, x and we have y. i is an index of the examples, and in this case we have n examples. And you know, typically, typically the idea is that we have um, we have a bunch of points, and then we draw the line that fits the points. I tend to do it the other way around. I draw the line first, and then the points. That's seriously cheating, but it makes it easier to explain. Okay. Um, So we have several instances, x1, y1 pairs. And so for example, this point here might be the point x3, that is i equal 3. And then the corresponding height for that point is what we call y3. So those are my training points. That's a third training point. Order, the, order is irrelevant here. You could scramble them, the, the, the eyes, because the points will still stay where they, are, where they are. But the main important thing is that the data is just these red points. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to compute theta, which is the which is essentially the, the equation of the, the line. So in other words, theta 2 is going to give us the slope and theta 1 is just the intercept of the line. And then if I want to uh, know where y3 is, Uh, 
And so the prediction for the point will be this the line evaluated at x3. <coughs> so this is y3, <coughs> which is essentially the equation of the line evaluated at x3. All right, so those are all the quantities. That's essentially what linear prediction is, is you have a bunch of points, input, output pairs, and then fitting um, <coughs> A linear model is essentially, in this case, just fitting a line. Um, if we're in 2D, in 2D you would have two x's, x1, x2. You would still have y. And then there we would just fit a plane to the points. And as you go to higher dimension, and we can no longer draw it, but it's the equation that we have is still um, has a name, and it's the equation of a plane. And in high dimensions, we just call it a hyperplane. Okay, when we fit this, uh, what's um, what we're trying to minimize is the quadratic distance between y and y hat. So we're trying to minimize the sum from 1 to n of the quadratic distance of y minus y hat. Okay, so if you think of this, this guy here is y minus y hat. And the reason why I'm drawing this as springs, I guess that. and I will make more clear this idea of energy, is that if you had a spring associated to each point and the line, and if you move the line and you let go, this, this line would go like, you know, da -da 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 -da, and then it will stabilize at the minimum energy configuration. And what we're trying to, the goal is to essentially minimize those vertical distances. Okay, when does this fail? Sorry? That's correct. So one way where this would fail is I've drawn the points here nicely on a line. Um, they're not actually in a line. They're, that's, but they're sort of their population tends to look like a line. So I'm using a line. The line doesn't go through any of the points, interestingly enough. Okay, so we're making an error on the training set. These points in red are the training set. And for each point in the training set, we actually make an error. And that's one of the important things to learn in, in this world, that um, you will never be, comp uh, you never get zero errors. Part of doing machine learning is learning that there will always be a statistical error and that you have to deal with uncertainty and you need to manage uncertainty appropriately. As we will see later, we will come up with methods that are capable of making the error on the training set zero. But if you make the error on the training set zero, your predictions often will be lousy. So a big part of this course will be learning to quantify uncertainty and manage uncertainty appropriately. Um, <coughs> where else could this fail? And by the way, just to get a sense here, uh, come to you now. How many of you have done these squares before? Okay, at least the undergrad guys. Uh, put your hands up. I actually do want to see. Um, all right, so a lot of you haven't done these squares before. Good, because you. That's, I've decided to go slowly, um, so you will learn. Le this is least squares essentially that we're learning today. Um, and um, often many undergrad degrees teach this, um, but don't worry if you haven't seen it before because you're learning it. That's the objective of today's lecture. And moving on, why, where can this fail? If all the points were on a vertical line? 
all the points in a vertical line, yeah, that would be also problematic. What was the first answer? The, or from over here? Oh, um, the, well, thanks for asking. So the one problem would be, what if the points are like this? then kind of obviously that should be a quadratic, not a linear model. A linear model would be the wrong model to model those points. And, and by the way, I haven't said so, but the, think of these. So let's put a legend here because I think it will help. I'm going to use a, these red circles. Let's say that these are the training data. And then I'm going to introduce a test point in, let's see, what color haven't I used? Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Orange. So I'm going to introduce now a test point. Now, a test point, I don't fit a test point. A test point hasn't been given to me. Um, it's only after I fit the model, so as we did before, after I fit the model, then I <laughs> give it a new point which I'm going to call here. So in this case, let's actually count this. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in this case, n is equal to eight. And then I get a new point, x9. And for x9, I only get the x. I don't get the y. And my objective is to compute the y. And then the way I compute the y is I just evaluate the line. And I get this guy here and this height, this height is y9. Where y9 as before is just y of x9. In other words, is equal to theta 1 plus theta 2 times x9. Oops. Okay. So I'm evaluating uh, the line at the point x9 in order to do the prediction y, y hat 9. Now, um, this, of course, if the points are not in a line, it's not going to work well. Um, if every, everything, all the distances are being measured vertically, that's the least squares criterion that, that Gauss gave us back in several centuries ago, um, and it's still very popular. Um, there's better ways of measuring distances, like to deal with this issue of all the points being in a vertical line. You might not want to use this distance, but you might want to use something a bit smarter, like maybe the perpendicular distance to the line. Later we will see methods that try to do this. Uh, what else could this fail? There are few outliers. Outliers. <coughs> if there was an outlier, like an outlier is a point that is not like the other points. So suppose you had a point up to here. Then the line will be all of a sudden will swerve because that spring would be pulling it so hard that this line would actually, just that one single point is going to affect the line. So if you have mislabels and the web is full of mislabeled data, um, you will get to play with some Twitter data where you need to do um, one of the exercises, the 340 guys have already done this, is I give you like a million tweets um, with happy faces and sad faces and I ask you to build a model that predicts whether a tweet is happy or sad. And once you do that, then you take all the tweets about your favorite movie and you can predict what the sentiment is about the movie. So you could predict just before the Oscars which are the most popular movies. And often that is actually can predict the way elections go, the way Oscars go, et cetera, et cetera. Twitter gives you enough of a, a um, of a signal to actually forecast a lot of things. Um, it's just the same as polls. It's just, it's just a public poll. Um, and there, however, quite often people write, I just failed my exam, happy face. And so the, the signal has mislabels. And dealing with outliers is an important part. But for now, we will assume that this doesn't happen. 
and we will assume that the data indeed is in a nice, follows this linear trend, and we will assume that there's no outliers. Um, in the next class, we will deal with outliers, and then next week, uh, so actually next week, both classes, we will learn to deal with nonlinearity and with outliers. Okay. So, now we have several data points. So, I is an index that goes from 1 all the way up to n. And then we also have the several inputs. So, the inputs in total. I will use I as the index of our Typically throughout the course, I will be an index of a number of data instances, and that N is the total number of data instances in the training set. And then J is the index of the input features. So for example, for energy prediction, uh, where D was equal to 2, J1 corresponds to the wind speed, and J2 corresponds to the number of people. Okay. Um, now, once I do that, I will actually not want to write the, the equation. So this, for example, if you, we already saw it before that I used yi equal to 1 times theta 1 plus xi times theta 2. So that was the equation of a line before. Um, the trick that I'm using here in addition is that to deal with the bias, oh, and I, I just realized I didn't have, that should be easier to see. Um, to deal with the fact, in order to come up with a very compact representation for writing this equation, instead of writing that sum of a j's and, and then there's going to be an extra index of our i's, I would like to write everything in just with a matrix in a very tight notation. Because if I have very tight matrix notation, it becomes really easy to code this as well in Python. And it becomes really easy to manipulate this to come up with algorithms. So I will try to shift us to uh, matrix notation um, right from the beginning. Because the sooner we move, think in terms of matrices, the easier it is um, to code and to manipulate the data. Um, most data can be mapped to matrix format. And once everything is in matrix format, whether it's a text collection, whether it's a, a collection of images, uh, then it becomes easy to manipulate different data sources with the same code. OK, so the trick that I'm also using is that I'm going to always let the first input be equal to 1. OK? And that's only so that I can write this as xi1 theta1 plus xi2 theta2. Um, and so I don't need to write, instead of writing um, y is actual to, equal to x theta plus some extra term, I will be able to avoid having to do this because my first entry will always be equal to 1. So I'm going to assume that I always have one input that is just one. And all that is doing is just adding this bias. OK, because I'm just putting a one there. OK, so that's just a trick to make the writing <coughs> less. And of course, now each point, because each point yi, so for example, y1, is just equal to x11, which is 1 times theta 1 plus x12 times theta 2. Okay. Um, so I can either write it like this, or if I use matrix notation, that's just this vector times this vector, which is much more succinct. And instead of writing it for each index i, um, the index i is over the vector. OK, so questions? For the rest of the course, I'm going to use this notation. So it might 
so and by the way I like my classes to be this is a great class so keep the questions coming if anything isn't clear because at this stage I'm just trying to set up the notation that we're going to be using okay. all right I will uh, move on. Oh, sometimes I will also rewrite this as the vector x1 and, and I'm going to put a bar here because I can't do bold with my pen. So the underscore means it's a vector. Um, and it's a vector of d dimensions. All the way up to xn. times theta, the vector theta, which is just the dimensional vector. <coughs> okay, so that's just another way to write this. All right, so here's the example. So we had two inputs. Um, so this was uh, the wind speed and the people inside this building, and then the output was y. And so my y consists of um, this is my y, this column here. And then for, in order to generate the matrix X, I just take the first uh, two inputs and then I add another vector of ones. And I need the vector of ones because I need a line to have an intercept. Because if I don't have an intercept that I can, if I can't shift my line up and down, I will not be able to model data that has a certain height because my line has to go through the origin. So I need to have those ones. And in this case, I have three parameters. Uh, one parameter is how up or down the plane is. We're into D now. We have a plane. And then so theta 1 controls up and down. And then theta 2 controls the slope in this direction. And then theta 3 controls the slope. So I have two slopes and one height. Those are my three degrees of freedom. And if I have a new, so let's now take an example. Let's assume that theta happens to be this vector here. And if theta is this vector, if I want to make a prediction for, um, um, for one of the inputs, then using that theta, and using the training set, I can make these predictions on the training set. So these are predictions on the training set. Okay. In other words, for these red points that I have here, I'm just computing all of these guys here. The, the value of the line uh, at the training points. Of course, predicting on the training data set is not very interesting because you already know the right labels for the training data set. Um, however, by doing those predictions, you can compute the error and you can adjust theta. And once you can predict on the training set, you can go on and you can predict for new x's. So given a new x, suppose you have a new x, which is 50 and 20, then you just basically, as before, you add a 1. And then you use the theta that we had, and then you just multiply x times theta. Okay. So to summarize, linear regression is all about knowing how to form these matrices. Once you know how to form these matrices, um, pretty much your code is done. There's only one missing line of code, which is how you compute theta. That's the only thing I haven't told you how to do, how to get theta, how to get the slope and intercept. But if you know how to form, so step one, when you get new code, when you get data, is you need to massage the data into the matrix X and the vector Y. Once that is done, there will be an extra line of code that tells you how to compute theta. And then in order to make new predictions, um, you just need to form the vector x again and then multiply times, times theta. So it's all matrix vector mon uh, multiplication. 
All right. The error function. Let's look at it. So I have already told you that the error function is essentially this, which is essentially the sum from 1 to n over all the data of the quadratic distances, yi minus yi hat squared. Okay. Um, if I want to write this, my y hat, uh, I had told you, is just x times theta if I want to put it in matrix notation. And then my vector y, and this vector is n by 1. The matrix is n by d. And this matrix is d by 1. Therefore, this whole thing is 1 by 1. So just keep track of the dimensions here. So it's just the matrix times the vector. And then because we're transposing the vector times itself, we get escape, which is what we would expect because this is a, this guy here is one by one. Escape. So we can either write it component-wise using sums, or we can write it in matrix notation um, in this form. Throughout this course, I will favor matrix notation because it's much more compact. And once you form the matrices, it's really easy to manipulate um, the matrices. Now, if we're in 2D, okay, in 2D, when you have two thetas, you might, in particular, if you have a model that's y i equal theta 1 always times a 1, I, I will not in the future put the 1 there, but it's sort of implicit that there's a 1 multiplying theta 1 plus xi times theta 2. So I have two thetas, and if I have two thetas and I plot this function j of theta, the cost function, it depends on theta 1 and theta 2, and it's a function that will have a term that depends on theta being squared, and then it's one that's theta being linear, and then a constant term. So it's the equation of a quadratic. And because we have a, and it's positive, because quadratic is positive. So we have an equation of a quadratic, and in 2D, that's what it looks like. It's a parabola. Now, the nice thing about the parabola um, is that if we want to find a place where the error is minimum, we can find it easily because the, a parabola only has one minimum. So the solution is the bottom of the parabola, which is easy to find. Okay. Now, one of the things that we will do soon and will be useful later is that for a parabola, we can also slice it like I've done here with these black lines. We can slice it and then we can look at all the points of equal height. And the points of equal height, they are plotted using these contour lines. Okay. And now here is the fact I need from calculus. This is like what I need as a background for this course. The gradient, that is the, the, the vector of derivatives of j of theta of a multivariate function, multivariate meaning that it has more than one variable, so it's two variables in this case. Um, the gradient is the vector of derivatives. In other words, it's the derivative with respect to theta 1 and the derivative with respect to theta 2. If you use those two, you have a vector in 2D. Now, if you plot those vectors, that you get these blue vectors here. And the fact from calculus that I need you to know is that the gradient is always perpendicular to the contour plots. In other words, the gradient is the direction of steepest change. In other words, think you're skiing, snowboarding, okay, up right now, lots of powder. Um, if you go up Cyprus, you want to follow the gradient, the steepest direction. You essentially you look for the place where there's the biggest vertical, and you go that way. And that's essentially what learning is about. Learning is about following gradients to the lowest location, which is where, where j of theta gets minimized. 
Okay, and when j of theta gets minimized, your line is perfectly aligned with the points. We will be able to do this computation analytically in this case because there's only one minimum. So in this case, it will be really easy. But later for neural networks, there's not going to be one minimum. There's going to be multiple minima. And so we're not going to be able to do this by hand. And so we're going to use a computer to do it. But the, the, the concept will still be the same. We'll, the one result from calculus we need in this course is exactly this. To know that um, to minimize a function, you follow the derivative and you look for the point where the derivative becomes zero. Okay, so um, homework exercise. I would like you to write, expand the vector y, expand the matrix x, and convince yourself that this should be an equality sign. And the reason why I want to give this to you as an exercise is because I want you to get used to the notation quickly to, and to be able to, uh, an important part of doing research with uh, machine learning is to be able to take data and be able to write it in terms of matrices. Because the code is always written in terms of matrices, whether it's MATLAB, whether it's Python. So it's important to be able to do this map. I'll do an example uh, with the derivatives. Now let's assume we have j of theta. So we want to find the minimum, and the way to find the minimum is to compute the derivatives. Okay. Now suppose that n is equal to 3 and d is equal to 2. Then j of theta would be equal to um, y1 minus minus x1, um, let's just write it minus theta1, minus x1 times theta2 squared plus y2 minus theta1 minus x2 times theta2 squared plus y3 minus theta1 minus x3 times theta2 squared. Okay, so that would be the case when n equal 3 and equal 2. And if you want a derivative of j of theta with respect to theta1, and I use delta to indicate just the derivative, then you would have and actually, let me already write this as the sum from i equal 1 to 3 of yi minus theta 1 minus xi theta 2 squared. If we take the derivatives, then we would get, let me use a different color, we would have the sum, derivative is linear. And because derivative is linear, you can take the derivative inside the sum. And then so you would have 2 times yi minus theta 1 minus xi theta 2. And then the derivative with respect to the term inside would be just minus 1. And so this is equal to minus 2 times the sum from i equal 1 to 3 of yi minus theta 1 minus <coughs> xi theta 2. Okay. And then if once you have this derivative, uh, we're going to equate it to 0 in order to find the minimum. But then we need to do the derivative for theta 2 as well. Now here is the catch. I'm doing this so that you essentially learn the painful way what it would be like. If you did not, didn't use matrices, you would have to do this for each parameter. And if you have 100 parameters, you would have to repeat this calculation 100 times. And it would be really painful. Fortunately, we have matrices. And matrices also come with properties. 
And all these calculations, instead of doing them this painful way, will be done with matrices much more quickly. Now, I'm going to um, use a result that's uh, from matrix calculus, uh, a result of matrix differentiation. Um, now, this I don't think is in the background of many of you unless you've used this in graphics before. But we're going to define here matrix derivatives. It is, it's easy to prove these, and you can go to Wikipedia and look at the proofs. But for this course, I will always give you these. Um, if you want to take the derivative of a matrix with respect to a vector, that's just the matrix transpose. If you want to take the derivative of a quadratic form, which is theta transpose a theta, with respect to theta, then you just get 2a transpose theta. Okay. So just accept these as facts. Um, and if you want to know their exact derivation, go to Wikipedia or just come to my office hour and I'll give you, we'll go over it. Uh, but once we accept this, we can write the cost, we can compute the derivatives all in one single go, all of the derivatives with respect to all the, the vector of thetas, as opposed to doing them one by one. And so in particular, the derivative of the cost is just the derivative with respect to the vector, so now theta is a vector, of this quadratic form, which is just y transpose y plus theta transpose x transpose x theta minus 2 uh, y transpose x theta. Okay, so I'm just multiplying terms. Now, why was I able to group the two cross terms? In other words, y transpose x theta and x theta transpose y. Exactly, because we're dealing with scalars. So it's always useful to always write the, the dimensions. So this guy again, I remind you, is n by 1, n by d, and this one is d by 1. And so if we look at this guy, this is 1 by n times n by d times d by 1. So this whole product here is, whoops, 1 by 1. It's a scalar, and I can add scalars. So that's why I group those two. Now the next step is just to use these two properties, property 1 and property 2. Well, and actually I should have had a third property which is the derivative of constant is 0. So that will give me 0 plus the derivative of theta transpose x transpose theta which is just 2 times and then the matrix essentially this is the matrix A in this case. So I will just get 2x transpose x theta minus 2. And in this case, this is my other matrix, say, A prime. And so I just transpose it to x transpose y. And that's the derivative. That's all the derivatives. It's a vector of derivatives. And it's a vector that depends on x and y. And that's why. Over here, this vector changes depending on the location of x. Once we have the vector, all we need to do is equate it to 0 in order, so where the derivative becomes 0 in all directions, so the derivative, derivative is slope in this direction and the slope in this direction, where it becomes flat, that's when it's at the minimum when we've um, been able to when we've been able to descend in this quadratic and we get here when we are down at the minimum that's our solution we have a flat plane and that happens when we equate this derivative to zero so if we equate it to zero we have 2x transpose x theta equal if I move now this to the other side, it becomes 2x transpose y. I cancel the 2's. <coughs> 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 
and I get theta equal multiplying both sides by x transpose x inverse I get the least square solution <coughs> and that's the one line of code that was missing how to compute theta so if you know how to take your data and you massage it into the matrix x and the vector y computing theta is just basically doing a matrix inversion in, in your code multiplying matrices and there's your theta and when you have a new x you just multiply that new x times theta and that gives you the prediction and that's all there is to linear prediction linear prediction is essentially a um, very simple task however it's illustrated an important concept that you can think of learning as a process of optimization okay. where the cost function is a function of the data and is a function of some parameters and then learning is just a, basically about adjusting those parameters till that there, you get to the bottom of the cost function where the derivative is zero. In this case we can do it as I've done by hand analytically <coughs> on a piece of paper. Uh, for most problems in machine learning we will not be able to do this by hand and we will require uh, the use of computers. Okay so you might also be wondering what happened so in this case why the reason why I had a vector for y is because I only had one output so we had several inputs but I only had one output however the linear model can be trivially extended to have several outputs for example in this case with two outputs y1 hat and y2 hat all I need to do in order to have an extra output is just add a new vector of thetas so in that sense I've created a second plane um, that's independent of the first plane and that's giving me my now my multivariate predictions so I, now I can go from D inputs to C outputs and fit essentially fit a series of hyperplanes which allows me to do multivariate uh, linear prediction um, when we do neural networks and logistic regression and all these other techniques later on uh, we will always do the same thing. We will always take the data, massage it into a matrix X and a matrix uh, Y. And then the task of learning will be constructing a cost function, minimizing that cost function to give us the solution. Okay, so it's, it's very mechanical. Once you write a cost function, in fact, it, the task, I mean, we're going through this because we're learning it now. Um, but once you write a cost function, you can just use generic code to give you the solution theta. So you would never actually um, do this. Um, so where your thinking is required is coming up with a good cost function. And as we saw, this least squares cost function, which is used by everyone ad nauseum, um, can often fail. If there's outliers, if the model is really nonlinear, if points are, tend to be aligned vertically, um, and in those cases you will need to think about what is the right cost function and that's going to be your innovation coming up with good cost functions the rest is really mechanical the rest is just a question of computing derivatives and most of it in today's age and there's modern packages that do the differentiation for you automatically in fact there's a very nice package which I strongly recommend you familiarize yourselves with I'll put a link to it in the course it's called Theano In Theano, you give it uh, an objective function and it automatically computes the derivative for you. It completely, actually automatically finds the minimum for you. So you, you don't even need to write the derivatives. You don't need to know any calculus to use it because obtaining derivatives from objective functions is something that computers are capable of doing automatically these days using automatic and symbolic differentiation. Nonetheless, in this course, we will need derivatives because um, we need to learn what's behind those packages so that we can also modify them and implement our own. Um, and that's pretty much linear prediction. Um, in the next class, we're going to do the exact same thing that I did today. We're going to come up with, in fact, the answer will get us exactly the same as the least squares answer. But we're going to start from a completely different perspective. I'm going to introduce probability because I mentioned that there were errors for each point and there was a question of uncertainty. 
And the right way to manage uncertainty is through the use of probability. So probability is the tool that will allow us to manage uncertainty. So in particular, we'll need to introduce something called the multivariate normal distribution. And uh, I'm going to go over its definition. However, I strongly, strongly encourage you to go to the Wikipedia page, look at what the multivariate distribution looks like before the next class. Um, it'll make it a lot easier to understand. Go ahead. The equation we derived has a pretty famous name. Uh, the normal equations? Normal equations. Yeah. yeah, this equation here is called the normal equations. Thank you. And also, if you want to make a prediction, a prediction is just y times the new x times, um, suppose you want to make a prediction that on the training set, it will be y hat is just x times theta. <coughs> oh, and because this is a solution to a problem, we put a hat to indicate that is the solution. And we often call this the estimator <coughs> or the estimate. And this in particular is called the least squares estimate. And so if this is y is x times theta, then this is equal to just x times x transpose x minus 1 x transpose y. Um, this whole thing here, we often call it the matrix H. And this gives us. Um, we can rewrite it like this. And, a, and it's H because it's, it's called a hat matrix because it puts a hat on Y. You multiply Y by H is the same as putting a hat on the Y. Okay. But oh, actually, let's leave it there because you're writing. But um, so in the next class, I'm going to start with probabilities. I'm going to take the same problem, but I'm going to cast it as a, a problem of multivariate Gaussian distributions. And then I'm going to show that if our objective is to maximize our, minimize the uncertainty about the data, or equivalently maximize our information about the model um, explaining the data, uh, we will get a principle called maximum likelihood. And maximum likelihood is going to give us the same solution than what we obtain by doing optimization. The only difference is that once you have this in a probabilistic framework, we will also be able to quantify the uncertainty as to how certain we are that we're making right predictions or not. And then probability will essentially be the glue that will allow us to build bigger models. Essentially, it's going to give us a language for manipulating um, the models and building sophisticated models to, to, you know, to do more interesting tasks. All right, guys, see you um, next week. Can you go to the slide where you had expanded the, this one? Yeah, over here. Can you have one in this case? Yeah, well, no, um, it depends on how I'm defining it. I'm, I'm assuming that this is xi2 and then this is one input one. Okay, well, I think that's what you're saying.